Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Madison County in Illinois, I was a teletype operator in the United States Air Force. I was a crypto guy. We monitored Russian and Chinese teletype. I had just come out of tech school and went back home to Southern Illinois, where I was raised. I have top secret clearance. In fact, I went one above top secret my last year of service overseas. So I was very leery of saying anything. I was just on my way up to visit a friend one morning, on home, on leave. I had my dad's car. He was at work. I'm driving up to the campus, up on University Drive, and there's this little old church, St. Paul's United Church of Christ, right there on the frontage road, right before you head up into the bluffs, into the university proper. I had driven down there for some reason, just to see what was down there. I had never driven down there before. It was a kind of foggy morning, kind of misty and rainy. There is nothing behind this old church other than a bunch of hayfields. There were a bunch of hay rings where the guy had just dug through and done the hay thing. I'm driving down the road. I was going to turn around in the grass behind the church, and I see this bear way down on the dirt road, and it is bent over, splashing water in a puddle in the middle of the road. As I pull down closer to this thing, it's not a bear, and it is huge. I bring my car within about 10 yards of it and then veer off into the field and get out with my door between me and the thing. And it stands up. It's like eight or nine feet tall. It looked like a large, black hair-covered humanoid. I grew up in southern Illinois. I'm a hunter. My dad was a hunter. I had a goose gun in the trunk. I get the gun out. Something in my head clicked, and I'm thinking... Of course, there were all these stories about these things up by Alton, Illinois, but I had never really heard anything about my area. But something in my head clicked. I remember hearing about Bigfoot in California, and I thought, this is one of those Bigfoots, and I'm going to wound this thing, and Barnum and Bailey, here I come. I shot off with this goose gun to the left of this thing, and it didn't move. And then I shot off to the right, and it still didn't move. Something inside of me said, you can't hurt this thing, and if you try to hurt it, it's only going to hurt you. And with that, it shrugged what looked like its shoulders at me, and, and made its way off into the woods that are just north of the road. And each one of its leaps, jumps, whatever, was 15 to 20 feet at a time, and it was gone. Well, I completely freaked out. I went into the local gas station and washed my face off, and I drove right into Edwardsville and to the Madison County Sheriff's Office, and there was an old-time deputy, and he looked at me after I told him the whole thing, and he said, You know, I would think you were crazy or on drugs if it weren't for the fact that I have heard the same story in the last couple of weeks and three of them were from good friends of mine who were out hunting and saw the same thing you did. If I were you, knowing the kind of job you got and what you're getting ready to do, I wouldn't tell anybody about this for a long time, and you would be a lot better off. And that was probably the most sound advice I ever got, because if I had told somebody about this, they would have jerked my clearance and messed me around in the Air Force. The county deputy mentioned five other occurrences at this same time period. It was 11 a.m., misty and rainy, in bluffs, woods, and hayfields. On to the next one. Those who believe 
humans are the only intelligent species on the planet are misinformed. I've been tracking these elusive creatures for over two decades, and I have reason to believe that many of the ones that people have spotted are genetically engineered organisms. You're about to hear the first encounter I had with a Sasquatch. I reside in Northern California and have lived in the same area for 17 years. It's a hot spot for Sasquatch activity, and I'd rather not have a bunch of crazy people frequenting my quiet town, hoping to obtain photographs or video footage, so I won't give exact details. Aside from it being an annoyance, I've come to realize something else. Plenty of people are abducted when they go looking for the creatures, and that is something that our authorities regularly work to cover up. If it wasn't for the fact that I have military experience, there's a high chance my hobby would have gotten me killed by this point. Make no mistake about it. The mainstream TV shows that revolve around the topic of Sasquatch are heavily promoted for two reasons. The first reason is money, of course. The second reason is that there are people out there who want to undermine the seriousness of the subject, as long as the general public continues to acknowledge the idea of Bigfoot as a redneck joke, the truth will remain suppressed, just as it's always been. Sure, they're comedic and entertaining in a way, but it's best to remember that they're decoys. They are distractions from reality. If you continue to watch them, Try always to keep that in mind. I will say that I don't think we've ever been closer to a grand reveal, and I have to give a lot of the credit to social media. There's no question that social media has created more work for the people who are trying to keep things like this hidden from the public. And even though I've had plenty of experience tracking the creatures, I'm still not entirely sure of all the reasons why we conceal their existence. I only have my theories. For those of you who suspect that the military has plans to weaponize the Sasquatch species, I think you're on the right track. I'll tell you why I think so. I had found tracks many times before I was lucky enough to come across one of the creatures in the flesh. My golden retriever, Marty, started going crazy one day while we were on a hike through the mountains. He was all excited, seemingly not sure whether he should follow a scent or if he should warn me that we needed to leave the area. One of the many interesting aspects of the tracks was that it was clear that someone or something had tried to cover them up. Only a few of them were visible and looked as though something had swept over them with a stick or some other tool. Whatever had created the tracks, it was clear that Marty had never smelled a scent like it. It even seemed as though he was slightly disoriented after multiple whiffs. Another peculiar thing was how they would lead to a dead end in the sense that it was like the creature had up and vanished at the end of its stroll, sort of like it had just shot up into the treetops. That stumped both Marty and me for quite some time. My dog and I started visiting that trail several times per week. It was always nice, because it seemed nobody else ever used it, probably because it's inconvenient to get to. I'm skilled at covering our own tracks or any trace of us, so we would often camp out there and wait for the creature to arrive where we were, rather than us pursuing their whereabouts. Fortunately, Marty had been trained to stay as quiet as possible whenever I commanded. I always found it obnoxious when folks allow their dogs to constantly bark, so I made sure to train him well out of consideration for the neighbors. Anyhow, it was a regular thing for us to find tracks of the beast but it wasn't until probably around the 20th visit that we saw something that blew our minds. 
we watched as a very large military-grade chopper entered the area. Beneath it, secured to a line with a large container, the chopper steadily lowered the container near the ground and used a remote to open the thing. Out came an organism that I originally thought was a giant man covered in long black hair. The only reason I thought it was a man was that it was standing on two feet when it hopped down onto the soil. I peered through my binoculars and right away saw that this was no man. It was something else, a species I had never before encountered. Its face had some human-like attributes, mainly the nose, but the rest of it was, in my opinion, unrelatable. There appeared to be some sort of heavy-duty collar around its neck. I can't say what it was made of, but from where I stood, it looked to be steel. The organism stood there for maybe a minute before someone in the chopper played a strange noise that was more like a vibration rather than a sound. The organism's posture quickly changed and it collapsed into all fours before it ran out of sight. The way it ran across the terrain was so utterly peculiar. It didn't seem at all like how primates would move on all fours. It was far more agile, almost like it was skating on ice, if that makes sense. Immediately, it was evident that this creature was on a mission, and although I'm not exactly sure why, it was apparent to me that it was on a test, likely because nothing was going on in the area. It didn't take long for me to connect the dots and realize that whatever this thing was, it was what people were referring to as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. It wasn't exactly what I would have pictured the creature to look like, but the tall, hairy, extremely muscular physique was enough to know that not everyone was fibbing about their sightings. Marty sniffed the air with a look of major surprise. If he hadn't been so well trained, he for sure would have been barking incessantly. I'm not going to lie, that was one of the few times I felt genuinely intimidated while out in the woods. I felt a sense of vulnerability that I had never experienced before. The only other time that even came close to a feeling was when I stumbled upon a mama grizzly and her cubs while in Alaska. But that's a whole other story. Marty and I continued to observe the helicopter from beneath the tree branches while it proceeded in the direction of where the creature headed. I didn't want either the humans or the strange animals to spot us, so we patiently waited for around 10 minutes until they were a little further off in the distance. As soon as we arrived home, I had to take a bit of time to decompress. I always had a feeling that cryptids existed, but it's a whole different ball game when you actually see it for yourself. After allowing my thoughts to settle, I got on the web and read a whole bunch of accounts looking for any that were similar to mine. Surprisingly, I found a report that was written by an alleged whistleblower. This individual claimed to have worked at a government base and mentioned the agenda to create beings that are superior for war. In other words, the U.S. government wants to engineer super soldiers. I found some of the information difficult to comprehend. It stated that these things are essentially clones of very early humans. According to the person who wrote the report, training these organisms was an even much greater challenge than creating them. Supposedly, this is an endeavor that the military has been pursuing for many years and has been a controversial topic among those who are aware of it. So, it was a few days later that I went back to the area. It was like my curiosity got the best of me overpowered any trepidation that followed the event. I left Marty at home, and I was careful to check that the location was free of any aircraft. The last thing I wanted was for any authority figures to find me snooping in the area. To make a long story short, 
I was cut loose from the army many years before this time. It just wouldn't have been a good look for me to invite any suspicion my way, given my record. On the other hand, I was so much deeper in the wilderness than most people that go. I doubted the government would be too worried, hence why they chose the place to be one of their testing grounds. After heading in the direction that I had watched the creature run off to, I soon stumbled upon a series of trees that had large, square-shaped green buttons hanging at various heights. There were smudges of mud on each one of them, which indicated that something with muddy hands had been slapping the buttons. This is going to sound crazy to some, but... I had stumbled upon an obstacle course, one that the government uses to test and train the abilities of the biologically engineered soldiers. On to the next one. I'm sure some people will have a difficult time believing what I'm about to say. I think I've reached a time in my life where I care much less about being ridiculed. My story takes place in Spokane, Washington. My company transferred me there from the Detroit area back in 2005, and I was grateful for the change. My marriage had been on the rocks, and my wife and I seemed to revive our relationship over the excitement of trying something new. It was funny. We often talked about how beautiful the Pacific Northwest looked to be, but neither of us had ever once visited any of those states. Then, all of a sudden, there we were, preparing to move out there. It truly felt like it was meant to be. By the way, neither of us had ever put much thought into the subject of Sasquatch. The transition happened rather fast and my company even assisted in helping us locate a place to live until we felt settled. They found a very nice house in the outer hills of the city. My family instantly fell in love with it, as we all thought it looked like a little cottage straight out of a fairy tale. I have four children, the older two are girls, and the younger two are boys. We had probably been living there for about a month, when I decided to take a stab at teaching my youngest boy, Nolan, to ride a bicycle. He was a couple of weeks away from turning five, and my wife, Katie, wanted to get him a bike for his birthday. The other three kids had all received bicycles on their fifth birthday, so it made sense to carry out the tradition. It was as I was reinstalling the training wheels on my other boy's old bike that I saw something quite startling. One of the two garage doors was open at the time, and it faced part of the forest that encompassed about half of our property. Part of what we loved about the property was how it expanded into what I believe was a state preserve. It seemed like there were endless acres of woods and open fields to explore. It was as I was putting those training wheels on the small bicycle that I thought I noticed a face near the edge of the woods. It reminded me a lot of one of those paintings where various figures and shapes are camouflaged into the natural environment, where you have to adjust your eyes and look hard to spot them. My initial thought was that I had imagined it. So I turned my head away for a second, and when I looked toward the woods again, the face was no longer there. I didn't think much more into it at the time, for I thought the idea of Bigfoot being real was silly. It was later that evening that I took Nolan out to try riding the bicycle up and down our driveway. He seemed to catch on pretty quick, so after about 20 minutes of successful riding, I went to grab my cell phone from the car and then realized Nolan had gotten back on the bike by himself. I suppose he had gotten a little overly confident because he started to ride quite fast without anyone jogging alongside him. It was too late before I could get to him. He had already fallen off and was crying from the shock of smacking the ground. It was as I was running down the driveway to help him up that I suddenly gasped 
at the sight of a large figure emerging from the woods. It looked like a large gorilla, only it had light brown fur, much lighter than any gorilla I had seen in the zoo or on TV. As I got a better look at it, I saw that its face was much more like that of a human than that of an animal, at least in the eyes and nose region. Its mouth and lips were extremely puffy, much like a monkey's. I don't even know how I had time to consider all of that since I was immediately running toward the figure, yelling for it to get away from my child. Nolan's back was turned away from the creature, so I don't believe he had ever seen it before. It was about 15 feet away from him. Of course, all of the noise prompted him to turn around, and I noticed how the sight of the creature caused his crying to cease. Understandably, he was so perplexed by what he saw that it distracted him from the fresh scrapes on his knee and elbow. As I picked up my kid and turned around to dash for the house, I saw my wife standing on the front porch. She heard the commotion from inside the house and came rushing out to check on things. She was frozen, blatantly so confused over what was present in our yard. After I made it up the porch and guided everyone inside, I looked out the window but the creature was nowhere in sight. When my wife was finally able to gather her wits, she explained that the intruder leapt into the air and appeared to use the treetops to move out of the area. In the foyer, my other kids quickly joined us and were bombarding us with questions as to what had happened. It was easy for them to see that we were very shaken up, and it wasn't long before those feelings of worry began to transfer to them. My wife and I asked the kids to go to their rooms while we cleaned up Nolan's scrapes. After bringing him to his bedroom, we then headed to the kitchen to discuss what we saw. It was clear that we were pretty eager to reassure the other that neither of us had imagined the whole thing. Looking back on it, it's interesting how even though we saw the same thing, we had different interpretations of it. As I stated before, it was my opinion that the creature looked more like an animal than a man. However, my wife had a different opinion. To this day, she still claims that what she saw looked like a bulky older man who had hair from head to toe. We did at least agree that the intruder was hunched over like an ape with its fists on the ground. It was obvious that the kids were scared and for the sake of keeping the household calm, my wife and I decided to visit each child individually so they could convince themselves that there was nothing to be worried about. I have to admit that it's a bit unsettling to think about how easily most of us were reassured by adults when we were children because we grow up to realize that adults are just as scared and confused, if not more so. Perhaps many children are right to suspect that monsters are part of this reality. I know it sounds corny, and yes, it was lying, but we couldn't think of anything else to do other than to tell our kids that one of the neighbors had dressed up in a costume and wanted to have some fun by giving us a little scare. We didn't want to have to say anything about the incident, but we knew that Nolan was going to talk about it frequently. He was a very chatty kid, so we felt we had to create a reasonable explanation for what he had seen. Luckily, it seemed to be easier than we had expected to calm the kids. I had reassured them that there was no reason to be afraid, and I desperately didn't want them to doubt that. As far as I could tell, there had been no sign of the creature, and I eventually started to shake the perturbed feeling. I was still blown away as to what had happened, but the feeling that we were in danger had mostly dissolved. However, those feelings quickly returned when my other son, Truett, ran from his room one night, yelling that the man in the costume was tapping on the glass and waving for him to come outside. When my wife and I went to check it out, there was nothing there. Because of the way the ground is outside his room, there should have been tracks of some kind, but there were none. It was because of that we concluded 
Truett had a nightmare. But his freakouts started happening so frequently that we knew something strange was happening. The thing was, I had no idea what I would do even if I were to catch the creature in the act. The size of the thing that we saw out in our yard was so intimidating that I felt as though even a rifle or a shotgun wouldn't do a whole lot. Other people have agreed with me throughout the years that you simply can't do the size any justice when you're describing it. It really is something that you have to see for yourself to get what I'm talking about. Every aspect of how Truett described the man aligned with how I perceived the creature. The last thing I wanted to do was to call the police. For one thing, I was confident that they wouldn't find anything. And the other thing was that having them around would undoubtedly upset the kids. The other three were already disturbed by the number of panic attacks that my boy had had. I always thought it was odd that the creature wasn't interested in visiting the windows of the other children. It was as if I never heard a single thing about it. Another strange thing about the whole situation was how Truett described the actions of the man outside his window. Allegedly, he would wave at my boy in a way that suggests that he should come outside, but the wave didn't seem at all like the way humans casually waved to one another. It would use its whole arm. The way Truett demonstrated the movement made it seem so very ape-like. That was when I became confident that the same creature was indeed visiting our property. I was without any clue as to how to move forward with the situation at hand. Sure, I was worried that I was going to be fired, but family always comes first. I initiated the move out of town before my request to transfer even had a chance to be considered by my company. With a bit of luck, they obliged, of course. I never mentioned the word Bigfoot, what I did was make up a story about how my wife was convinced she had a stalker, but she didn't know the identity of the man. Therefore, we were unable to report it to the police. I said that this was causing her overwhelming loads of anxiety, and she wouldn't be as content until she left the area. I can't say whether that things would have turned violent had we stuck around at this point. I tend to suspect we would have been fine the creature easily could have grabbed my boy if it had wanted to. It was probably just more curious than anything else. Anyway, better safe than sorry. On to the next one. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Valley of Bella Coola or not, but it's a very unique place. It's in the coastal mountains of British Columbia. And even though it's technically not on the coast itself, the coast isn't far. Various ferries shuttle people from Bella Coola to places like Vancouver. Bella Coola's near the water, and the mountains tower above it with glaciers and waterfalls galore. If you want to drive out of the valley, you have to go up what we call the hill, a road with an 18% grade that will take you up on the Chilcotin Plateau and eventually to Williams Lake, the nearest town of any size. I actually live in the small village of Hagensburg near the town of Bella Coola. And if you know Hagensburg, you can guess that I'm of Norwegian stock straight from the original settlers as the town was mostly made up of Norwegians and natives, the Nuxluck. Everyone calls me Grizz because I used to hunt grizzly bears. It was my claim to fame. I finally came to my senses after a good mauling, which was probably karma if you believe in such. I almost lost my arm, and I have some pretty good scars. I still have a couple of big bear pelts and I now feel bad that I killed these beautiful animals, even though one of their kind eventually tried to kill me. Bears are smart and really don't want anything to do with humans in general. We see them all the time in the valley, 
even on the streets of Bella Coola and Hegensburg, and they generally leave everyone alone. These bears are actually brown bears and are less aggressive than the interior grizzly bears as they have more food here on the coast, lots of salmon. So the word grizzly sometimes refers to the more aggressive interior brown bear, though they're basically the same species, but I just call them all grizzlies. If you've ever watched the live bear cams at Katmai National Park in Alaska, you can see how these big brown bears are. They get huge. Anyway, there's a lot to the story about the grizzly mauling me, but I don't usually tell it all. But here goes. Hold on to your hat. There's something really primitive about hunting. I think it's maybe part of our DNA. Well, men's DNA, anyway, from back when we were hunter-gatherers. I'm no anthropologist, but it seems to me that men are usually the hunters, and women gathered seeds and roots and prepared the food. If you talk to many women, a lot of them really hate hunting, but men generally don't, even the guys who don't hunt. Men seem to find something of a challenge in it, man versus nature, and the idea of bringing home the winter's meat. But there was once another kind of hunter, the one who eliminated danger to the tribe, and this type of hunter was probably the most revered because they had a lot of courage and made life safer for the others. This was the kind of guy who hunted grizzly bears and the big predators. Okay, so much for my armchair anthropology, but I want to explain to you why a grown man who appeared to be sane in all other ways would voluntarily hunt grizzly bears. In retrospect, I think I was trying to prove my worth, as well as being an adrenaline junkie, and it almost cost me my life. Almost. The real irony in this story is that when I got mauled, I wasn't even bear hunting. I was trying to get a deer to feed us through the winter. I had a tag for a mule deer, not a bear. It was autumn, and there I was, quietly tramping around in the thick forest, looking for deer. The Bella Coola Valley is lush coastal rainforest and gets lots of rain, so deer hunting here is very different from that in drier places, much more difficult. You're always fighting your way through thick vegetation, and usually you can't see far ahead. You can literally step on a sleeping grizzly before you see him. Before I continue, let me say that getting mauled by a bear is a common theme around here, not just with the locals, but with those who come in to trophy hunt. So hunting in general around here can be a dangerous proposition. On top of the thick vegetation, the valley goes straight up into steep mountains. So, you'd better be in good shape to hunt here. And you can't avoid the mountains, as it's illegal to hunt within 400 meters of the highway, which goes right down the middle of the valley for the most part. And a lot of this country isn't even huntable because of the thick vegetation. I know people from the flatlands who feel claustrophobic in these rugged mountains, as they feel like the mountains are hugging them and they can't get away. If you like long vistas and wide open spaces, you'll still want to come visit, but you won't want to stay. Back to the hunt. I knew one of the wide drainage coming down off the mountains that had very thick vegetation, but had lots of small open feed pockets and I knew this would be where I would get my deer. I'd hunted it before and always been lucky there. It was a steep climb at the bottom, but gradually leveled out enough that it could be hunted without killing yourself, trying to climb and push through thick shrubs and ferns at the same time. So, I'd been up there since early morning, walking an animal trail I'd found, stepping off it and hiding and waiting, then moving on. 
I hadn't seen hide nor hair of any deer so far, and it was now early afternoon. What I had seen, though, was sign of a bear, plenty of scat, and some of it was fresh. It was odd, as it's not unusual to come across bear scat, but there was too much, like a bear was frequenting the area, and I was beginning to think something was up. That plus the total lack of any sign of deer, and I was beginning to feel a little leery. After eating my lunch, I was actually considering leaving and going home for the day. I knew of a couple other places that might be good hunting, but I admit I was attached to this place given my past successes there. My enthusiasm was seriously waning, but I decided to give it another hour or two before giving up. I wondered if I weren't maybe being too noisy as I'd left the animal trail and was pushing my way through a thick stand of alders, brushing against them as I passed. Well, I suddenly froze, my instincts kicking in. I immediately knew I was in some kind of serious danger, but I didn't know from what. Somehow, my sixth sense had told me this, but it hadn't provided me with where it got the information. I'm a big believer in the sixth sense, and I think everyone has it. It's developed by using it, by being in places that are a little edgy. I was in danger. I knew that. I slowly lifted my rifle, taking off the safety, and was ready to use it when, bam, I was attacked from the rear by something that knocked me for a loop. I wasn't ready for the blow, and it knocked my rifle into the bushes and me in there behind it. I quickly pulled myself into a fetal position. I was carrying bear spray in a holster that went around my torso, but I'd had the wind knocked out of me and wasn't thinking to reach for it. Before I could even look up to see what was after me, it had attacked again, this time making a huffing sound, so I knew it was a bear. I felt a huge jaw grab my head, and I recall wondering if I'd somehow come between a sow and her cubs. Bears don't normally attack humans with no warning. The bear bit me in the face and neck, and all I could think was, okay, so this is how I'm going to die. I could feel the enormous weight of the animal as it partially stood on top of me. Time stopped and it seemed like the mauling took forever. But I know it had to last only a few minutes. The bear now grabbed my arm and began shaking it until I thought it would soon be ripped off. It all seemed painless, and I know now that I was in shock and my brain was blocking the trauma. I now smelled what I took to be the smell of death, the smell of carrion. My mind was playing tricks on me, or so I thought. But it soon occurred to me, even as I was being mauled, that I'd stumble upon the bear's cache. It had killed something, probably a deer, and buried it, returning to eat on the carcass. Stumbling upon a bear cache is the only thing that's as dangerous as coming upon a sow and her cubs, and I'd managed to do exactly that. I now realized that I had to play dead if I wanted to have any chance at all. I had to convince the bear that I was no threat to his food. I went limp. The bear still chewed on my arm. It was probably the most difficult thing I'd ever done, to lie still while that bear was chomping on me, but I did. I figured I'd be dead soon enough anyways, so... I might as well not prolong things. I was feeling really lightheaded, and I knew I was beginning to lose a lot of blood. So, I truly thought I was hallucinating when I heard a scream that made my ears almost vibrate. It was so loud. It echoed through the forest and seemed to go on and on and on. Suddenly, the bear let go of my arm. I could see it stand up on its back legs and look around. 
as if trying to peer into the thick vegetation. It again began making that low huffing sound it had made while initially attacking me. It now sounded like someone was tearing down the forest, trees breaking and falling into other trees, and this was accompanied by a loud stomping that made the ground beneath me literally shake. The bear turned, dropped onto all fours, and ran quickly, disappearing into the thick scrub. I was amazed I was still awake and hadn't passed out as the noise came closer and closer. I had no idea what it was, but I became clear-headed enough to remember. I had an emergency locator beacon, a PLB in my back pocket. I first tried to reach for it with my right hand and almost passed out. As this was the arm the bear had mangled, 60 stitches worth to be exact. I swooned a little and almost passed out, then reached for it with my other arm, pulled it out, and activated it. I really didn't think I had any chance at living through this, as I knew I was losing a lot of blood, but my stars were lucky that day, as things were lined up in a rare configuration that saved my life. The communication satellite happened to be right overhead, and there was a military chopper in Bella Coola that day, for some reason or other. Unbeknownst to me, within minutes of the PLB activation, my rescuers were on their way, having my GPS coordinates. Also on its way to me, however, was some force that left me mystified. Something stomping through and tearing up the forest. It sounded ferocious. I had no idea what it was, but I was grateful the bear had been afraid enough to leave me alone. In fact, it must have been really scared to leave its food cache. This fact gradually dawned on me. A bear is at the top of the food chain. What in the world would make it terrified enough to run off and leave its food? Obviously not humans, as it had already tried to kill one of those, me. When I was a teenager, I discovered the works of Clayton Mack, a Nuxalk Bellacoola native hunter who'd led the wealthy on trophy bear hunts. I'd read his writings with great interest when I was a kid, as I was imagining myself to also be a great hunter in the making. Most of his writings were about hunting grizzlies, but as I lay there, listening to this disturbing noise coming straight towards me, I suddenly flashed on a brief chapter he'd written about seeing a Sasquatch or Bukwa, as he'd said the natives called it. I'd read with great interest, then later come to believe he was just pulling reader's legs, having some fun, which he was known to do. Sasquatch was just a myth. It seems amazing to me now, all this time later, and knowing now that my arm was almost ripped off, that I had the presence of mind to even think about what was coming towards me, making all that noise. But maybe, instead of a Sasquatch, it was another bigger bear. The bear the first knew and was afraid of. After all, bears knew each other and know who to steer clear of. Some bears will kill and eat their own species. Somehow, though, I thought this had to be a Sasquatch, probably because a bear didn't scream like that, and it seemed now like maybe Clayton Mack wasn't kidding after all. I was about to pass out when the noise finally stopped. Whatever it was, it had either calmed down or had realized a human was nearby. Was that why it was so angry? Because I was there. Great, I thought. Something new to worry about. But I really wasn't very worried, as I knew I was about to die regardless of who or what was there to hasten it along. I had my eyes closed this whole time, trying not to pass out, but when I heard a low whistle right above me, I opened them. There stood a most magnificent creature. I've read lots of Sasquatch and Bigfoot accounts since I recovered from all this, and almost everyone talks about how ugly they are, 
but to me, this giant creature above me was just magnificent. He had slick black hair, and his eyes were the most incredible green color, like pools of that silty green glacial water you see in places like Emerald Lake at Yoho National Park. And every part of his huge body was in perfect shape, all rippled like a gold medal Olympian. And you could tell he was the master of the mountains and forest, a fact that Bear must have realized when it fled. I was too near death to be afraid. What could he do to me? I was already dying. He looked incredibly sad, then slowly reached down to touch my curly blonde hair, of which I had lots at the time, though now I'm going bald. He seemed fascinated by it. Just then, I could hear the sound of a helicopter, and it was soon hovering overhead. My PLB, it had worked. I'd forgotten all about it. The Sasquatch also heard it and was long gone before the chopper even got near me. The rest of the story, you can guess. I was taken to the hospital in Williams Lake, where I nearly died from loss of blood, which they soon fixed with a transfusion. My arm required many stitches to fix up, and I have some major nerve damage, but I can make do with it and still drive and do basic things. I've learned to tie flies with my left hand, having given up hunting for fly fishing. And though everyone still calls me Grizz, it would be more appropriate to call me something like Squatch. But I doubt if anyone would believe me if I told them the story. But that's okay, as I feel kind of like I've been witness to something very special, and that's more than good enough. On to the next one. Climbing trees was one of my favorite things as a little boy. I grew up in an isolated part of Massachusetts and could entertain myself for hours by exploring the woods outside our house. My father often joined me on the weekends when he didn't have to work. We would walk to nearby swamps and ravines and catch frogs, turtles, tadpoles, and whatever. He was my best buddy, but he passed away when I was only nine. I miss our little adventures so much that I ramped up the frequency of which I went on them. It made me feel as though he was there with me. Sometimes I could swear he was right there behind me, looking over my shoulder. As I snagged a plump bullfrog from a patch of mud, but when I would turn around, no one was there. It was the first anniversary of his death, and the tragedy struck me all over again. My mom was a very optimistic and spiritual woman, so I never felt like she had experienced quite the same grief that I did. I felt like she could always look at his death as a natural transition, and sometimes even something to celebrate. The older I got, the more I realized that must have been a defense mechanism. I find it somewhat shameful that I used to question how bad she felt over the tragedy. I was an only child, and I think she did everything in her power to help me feel as though everything was going to be okay. She had a good heart and was so brave. Boy, do I miss her. I started to feel very claustrophobic in the house one night. I simply needed to run off by myself, hoping it would make me feel like Dad was with me. It sometimes felt like his energy would come around. Of course, I cannot say if that was actually my father's energy or spirit, or if I longed so deeply for him to return that I would convince myself he was around. Perhaps it was merely a coping mechanism developed by my grieving brain. Maybe it came from a reluctance to accept that he was truly gone. I didn't even bother grabbing a flashlight because I just went straight for the door. I suppose I wasn't thinking clearly because I needed to get out of there and get some fresh air. It was harder to see than expected, but 
I'm confident I could have walked to my favorite tree blindfolded. It was a huge tree my dad and I nailed some wooden boards to to make a permanent ladder. When I reached the spot I usually sit in, a critter screeched and ran down the tree. I think it was a possum. That made my heart feel like it would jump through my chest. I wasn't expecting it because I had never experienced that sort of thing due to only climbing the tree during the day. But it wasn't long before I endured something else much more disturbing. Fortunately, the dense leaf coverage shielded my presence, helping me to hide. I couldn't believe my eyes as a man flew by about 50 yards away at a slow and steady speed. He was a little lower than where I was in the tree. It was dark, and I couldn't make out their features. All I could see was that they appeared to be an adult male and wore dark clothing. The whole thing was strange, no doubt, but I found it even more bizarre how the individual's arms and legs weren't spread out as he flew. He was in a standing position and leaned forward only slightly. The way he flew by, at first, made me feel as though he hadn't seen me. I had the impression that he was on his way somewhere, and I just happened to have arrived in the tree soon before he entered the vicinity. From what I could tell, he didn't turn his head even slightly in my direction. I only saw him for less than 10 seconds before disappearing into the darkness. Unable to process what I had just seen, I wanted to go home so badly, but I worried I'd get noticed as soon as I climbed down the tree. But only a few minutes later, I had grown so frightened and had to flee. As I made my way down the ladder, the flying figure returned. I was about halfway down when it felt like my blood froze. I don't know if it was just due to fear of the unknown, but it was like my instincts forced me to do whatever I could to remain hidden. All these years later, it seems that my senses reacted to the flying figure as if it were an apex predator. It made me feel much more vulnerable than I'd ever felt. I was much more exposed in that position. Only a few leaves hung to that level, providing minimal coverage. I distinctly remember my teeth chattering while I clung to the ladder. But once again, the flying figure didn't seem to notice me. It appeared to fly back in the direction it came without turning its gaze towards me. I continued to stay put until I was at least semi-confident that I wouldn't be heard once I landed on the ground. The steps didn't extend all the way to the bottom of the tree, so it was pretty much impossible to not make noise when climbing down. Since I knew the path toward home like the back of my hand, I spent a lot of time looking behind me, ensuring I wasn't being followed. But one of those occasions, I turned my gaze forward and I saw it. It flew across the path before me and was maybe 40 yards ahead. Still, it looked as though it hadn't noticed me. That was it. I couldn't take it anymore. I started booking it once it was out of sight, but shortly after that, I turned around and noticed it was following me. I had never experienced anything even close to that level of fear. I was so panicked that I neglected a thin but sharp branch protruding onto the trail, which scraped my cheek as I ran into it. It stung so badly, but the adrenaline of being stalked by a flying freak enabled me to dismiss the pain. After I veered around the corner, I looked behind me and didn't see anything. I kept thinking it would enter my view, but quite a few seconds had passed without anything. I abruptly stopped my stride because I wondered if it was taking some shortcut off the beaten path to intersect me. It was only then that I realized 
this thing didn't need to worry about the most accessible terrain. After all, it could fly. I ran for cover behind a sizable tree, hoping it would be wide enough to shield me had my follower reappeared. I stood behind that tree for what must have been a solid five minutes, and there had been no sign that anyone or anything was still pursuing me. Unable to take being out there any longer, I slowly started to step away from the tree when the flying man came into view about 50 yards off. I could tell by the way it was moving that it was attempting to be as discreet as possible so that it could better sneak up on someone. It wasn't heading directly for the tree I was hiding behind, but it did seem to be moving in that general direction. It reached the point where it was too close for me to move a muscle. Any step I would take would undoubtedly create too much noise, but it was only seconds before I felt like a guardian angel came to my rescue. I had no idea where it came from, but when I looked to my right, I spotted a large female deer. She looked as though she was sneaking through the area, hoping to avoid the detection of any nearby predators. I'll never forget the dreadful sound the deer made as the flying man landed on top of it. I only observed the scene for a second, but I'm sure I saw the man sink his teeth into the unsuspecting mammal's neck, and the impact had to have broken at least a few of the deer's bones. Everything I saw that night was beyond anything I thought possible. Without further hesitation, I turned and booked it for my house, this time without any interest in checking what might be following. I knew doing so would only slow me down. When I got inside, I went straight for the couch with a large quilt my deceased grandmother had made and tossed it over my body. I probably just failed to hear her as she approached, but I squirmed like a captured animal when I felt her place a hand on my shoulder. What's wrong? my mom said. What is it? I peeked below the quilt's edge to find her with her hands covering the telephone. She had been amid a conversation with my aunt as I burst through the doorway. Someone is out there, I said. No, something is out there. I don't think any mere human could do what that thing did. My mom looked as confused as ever. Sorry, Allison, but I'll need to call you back. My son doesn't seem to be feeling well. What's the matter? She asked as she sat next to me. But before I could respond, she remembered how difficult of a day it was for me. I know you miss your dad, sweetie, she said. And trust me, I do too. But it's so important we be strong. That's what he would want for us. I'm sure you can understand and appreciate. Mom, it has nothing to do with that, I interrupted. This has nothing to do with Dad. Whatever I saw out there was a ghost, a demon, something like that. It looked a lot like a man, but it was flying, and I watched it pounce onto a deer and bite its neck. She could tell I was stressed and didn't argue back after that because she probably thought I was undergoing trauma from the past and didn't want to agitate it. We sat there in silence while she patted my shoulder as I focused on one of the windows across from the couch. I'm pretty sure she resumed a pep talk about how I needed to be strong, but I was so distracted by the potential appearance of that flying freak. I was so convinced that it was going to show up. The potentiality of it attacking my mother and killing my last remaining parent was incredibly overwhelming, worse than anything I had fathomed. The truth was that there was nowhere in our house that I felt safe. There was no question that that strange entity could enter our home with minimal effort. My mom grew more alarmed with the more time that went by without being able to comfort me. Sweetie, if you really think you saw someone roaming in the woods by our property, I should let the police know. Do you think that's necessary? Or could your eyes have played tricks on you? 
I don't think the police would be able to do anything about this thing, I replied. You know, back when I was a kid, I sometimes saw strange things in my house when the lights were off. But as I grew older, I realized it was no more than my imagination. This wasn't my imagination, I protested. This thing was there. It really was there. It's out there right now, eating that deer. My mom took a deep breath before standing and walking over to close the blinds. I suppose she figured that would make me feel more comfortable, knowing that nothing would be able to look at me from outside. I then heard her walk into the kitchen to resume whatever she was doing before I barged in. The mac is almost ready, my mom called out. By mac, she meant macaroni and cheese, my favorite meal. I guess she figured serving me some comfort food would help set my mood straight. A few minutes later, when she brought me a bowl of mac and cheese, we both heard a roar from somewhere outside. Whatever it was, it didn't sound far off. The noise was so peculiar that it made my mom pause her stride. Neither of us had ever heard anything, even close to us creepy. It immediately made my skin crawl, and I could tell it did the same for my mom. When I looked at her near the doorway... I could tell she was still figuring out how to react. She was probably doing everything in her power to control her emotions and not allow herself to come off as too affected by the noise. After all, she didn't want to provide me with more reasons to become even more distressed. That was it, I said. I just know it was. It's out there, I'm telling you. My mom didn't argue. She continued to listen, still holding the warm bowl of mac and cheese with a couple of kitchen mitts. After another chilling roar, this one sounding much closer, my mom couldn't help but drop the bowl. Steamy, cheesy noodles went all over the wood floors and a corner of a nearby rug. Maybe we should go upstairs, my mom said, just in case whatever made that noise decides to come sniffing around. I hopped off the couch with the quilt still wrapped around me and followed her toward the staircase. Neither of us bothered to do anything about the spilled macaroni as my mom had been much more urgent to ensure we were safe. She waited for me to get in front and then flipped the lights off on her way up the stairs. I'll be honest with you, my mom said, once we made it into the movie room near the top of the stairs and shut the door. I had this strange feeling while I was making dinner. I felt like someone was looking at me from outside the kitchen. I didn't bother to turn on the outside light because I was worried that that could make it obvious that we were aware of their presence. So I tried to act as casual as possible when bringing your food in the living room. She seemed different. The main thing I recall was how exhausted she appeared. She was losing energy by the moment. That freaked me out because that wasn't typical for her. I had never seen her like that. Yet, she had started acting off right after I ran from something unlike anything I knew existed. Mom, are you okay? I asked, stumped on what to do. She hesitated to respond. It was hard to tell whether she heard me and didn't have the energy to respond or if her mind was elsewhere. I'm just going to rest here for a moment, she said. She then proceeded to sit on the carpeted floor and lean her back against the cushion. I have no idea why she just didn't sit on the couch normally. It would have been easier for her to merely fall into that position rather than put in the effort of lowering her body all the way to the floor beside it. I now see that as proof that she was heavily disoriented but what could have happened to her so suddenly? A few seconds later, my mom's eyes started to roll in the back of her head. I vividly remember screaming in horror as I ran to grab the telephone and call the police. 911, what's your emergency? The man said as he picked up the call. There, there's something wrong with my mom, I said crying on the phone. I was so worried because I thought she had to be dying. I had never before seen anything like what was happening to her other than when watching scary movies. The man on the other end of the call asked me another question 
but I didn't hear what it was because I was too distracted when my mom started convulsing. Mom, what's wrong? I shouted her way, but she didn't reply. Instead, a white, foamy substance started pouring from her mouth, and she toppled over onto her side a few seconds later. Please help, I yelled into the telephone, and the man reassured me multiple times that help was on the way. He continued to stay on the line with me, probably trying to walk me through the various things I could do to help until medical assistance arrived. Still, I was far too distracted by my mom's condition to comprehend what he was saying to me. I was at least able to see she was still alive because her body twitched until the police and medical personnel got there. As soon as help arrived, a female officer escorted me into the kitchen to question me about everything that had happened. When I say I told her everything, I mean everything. I told her about the flying figure in the woods, how it tackled the deer, and how my mom said she started feeling strange while making dinner. The female officer was very sympathetic, so she didn't mock me in any way. Instead, she told me everything was going to be all right and that she would make sure the medical staff did everything they could to help her get back to normal. Luckily, they were able to follow through on that promise. Later that night, my mom looked normal and spoke to me in the hospital. What was strange was how she seemed to have no recollection of what happened a few hours earlier. To her, it was like she was preparing my macaroni and cheese, then blinked and woke up in the hospital. She apologized over and over for putting me through something so traumatic, but I kept trying to reassure her that I was just happy she was okay. I was so worried that I would lose her, and the idea of losing both my parents was devastating. The doctors must have been pretty intimidated by her previous condition, so they had her stay until morning. I slept on a cot next to her bed, but I didn't get much sleep that night because I couldn't take my eyes off the window. It's probably just because I was paranoid, but I felt something was watching us from outside, something that meant to harm us. Thankfully, nothing else happened, but it wasn't long before my mom decided that she wanted to move out of our house. That was difficult because our final memories with my dad were there, things started to feel so off. My mom always played it off like something she ate caused her strange condition, but it wasn't until later in life that she revealed how she told me all that so that I wouldn't be terrified. She never really got that detailed about it, but it was apparent that she thought there was an evil presence lurking around the area. Never again did I experience anything close to that mysterious night but I've always felt stumped about what I encountered. Did my mom's condition connect to the flying freak I saw in the woods? Or was it something entirely separate and a mere coincidence that those things happened around the same time? Sometimes I feel tempted to believe I encountered a vampire, but would that explain what happened to my mom? Perhaps the vampires are real, but even those who believe in them are not aware of the extent of their power. It gives me the creeps to think that it had somehow gotten inside my mom's head and caused a sort of delirium. That would almost make the entity seem more witch-like or warlock-like, but why would it have tackled that deer and bit into its neck? I'm almost certain I saw it sink a pair of fangs into the poor animal's throat. Please know these dangerous entities are out there, and caution is essential while wandering in the woods. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!